In just a few decades, Korea's Hallyu wave evolved beyond recognition. In the early 2000s, Korean dramas were popular exports to mostly neighboring countries, primarily in Japan. Remember Winter Sonata and Peyong Jun? And the larger Asian market, of course. Korean films had auteurs like Park chan who had become a brand in itself, but for the longest time, it might have been niche on the global stage. It's safe to say we've come a long way since Winter Sonata or Old Boy. Marking the 21st anniversary of Arirang Radio's launch, we review what we collectively deem major turning points for Hallyu actors on the global stage. For this, we're now joined by Isaac Kim, culture critic and global head of content at YB- YLab. <laughs> Good morning, Isaac, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. I'm getting ahead of myself because I realize that our mission today is ambitious. Oh, well, I mean, it is a big day, right? So happy, you know. Happy birthday. Can we sing? Can we sing? Is, do we have rights to the song? Happy um, birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that might be one of the oldest songs that we collectively know. I think we're okay yeah. with IP. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's get started, Isaac. Um, I had a hard time pinpointing where to start today's discussion, so I went to the most obvious. I looked at headlines and saw who was generating the most amount of buzz, and I've got to say, Lee jung still holds the spotlight. Um, since Squid Game's a success and really hitting jackpot during that pandemic, and when we were just watching a lot more Netflix. And of course, yeah. uh, the second season of Waits is premiere on December 26th this year. So we thought maybe begin today's conversation on actor Lee jung Jae. After all, yeah. he also starred in a Star Wars spinoff. Oh, yeah. I mean, he is probably coming out of the, you know, um, this unprecedented, uh, what we call the post-COVID era, right? Like, right. he came out of COVID um, not just um you know on, on another level but really on a global level that was totally unexpected as well as unprecedented and um i mean i saw i remember seeing an interview you know on american television where people were like you know um meeting him for the first time and of course to american audiences they were like wow you're so great at this and that and like it was almost like uh, welcoming him to celebrityness or celebrity them, you know. But he's been a celebrity for so many years that, uh, you know, uh, but the, the whole world got to meet him, you know, mm. during COVID through Squid Game. And, so, and it's funny because his Squid Game attire, as you remember, because he's literally trying to hold on to his life in this all or nothing game. He looks a little bit scrubby. So I guess to, oh, yes. to audiences who are very familiar with Lee Jung-jae's career and his good looks and it, Really, he started out with a bang in the 90s, right? Um, it, it's not surprising he's handsome, but the actor himself said that his global fans were surprised to see him in red carpet events dressed yeah. to the T's. Yes, because, you know, I mean, I, I knew his name from, you know, I mean, I did not watch like um, all of his work from mm. the beginning of his debut. Sandglass, you know, Boreshige. Yeah, when I look at the pictures of when he was, I believe he was like 20 something, right? 22 yes. or 23. And like, wow, he is like, he gives me like, you know, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt vibes from the 90s or something. You know what I mean? Like, he uh, really was like, he looks like he, you know, was like, um, uh, you know, a model that was like drawn on paper, like, or, or you know what I mean? Out of like, <laughs> like a micro model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so when you think about coming from that context where, you know, um, in Korea, he was a national heart drop and he was a huge deal. And, you know, coming from that. But, you know, uh, where, where most of the world has now discovered him, he doesn't have he didn't have that image. Right. He, he totally was this, you know, like goofy, like uh, poor and like, you know, but a very uh, relatable character in Squid, Squid Game. So. You know, um, I mean, m- many things. I think that uh, the perfect timing was that, you know, for international audiences that don't have that context of this is a movie star or this is Korea's, you know, Brad Pitt or something like where they where people kind of have to just look at it objectively with a kind of like starting with a blank sheet. Mm. His appearance in Squid Game um, really showed that this is not a guy who only plays like, you know, leading male Mm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, like cultural icons, you know, like those kinds of like kind of positive movie star kind of roles. But here's a guy who like is really showing his acting ability by presenting himself in a character that probably, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, new actors when they when they want to go into acting, you know, it's not a lot of people want to go into acting to uh, look good and be sure. like a star instead right. of 
um, looking poor, looking bad, looking scruffy. And yet, like Leonardo DiCaprio to... as Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. I mean, you kind of want to be a star. And if you're as handsome as, I suppose, Lee Jong-jae or Leo, I don't know why Leo is the first one that comes to mind. But he's also, yeah, he's right. up there with those names of, you know, uh, really, really like uh, beautiful stars who uh, right. kind of get under um, appreciated because of their looks, you know, exactly. You know? Or uh, overappreciated because of their looks, but underappreciated in their acting ability because of their looks. It's, it's like a double-edged sword. And uh, you know what? Even Lee Jung-jae, uh, when, at the start of his career, when he was more of a TV star and before he even segued into the film industry, I, I think uh, his good looks worked against him, too. I mean, maybe he had the ability to act in different genres, but he was hired yeah. for the good looks, too, which worked for him. But eventually, he, he really, he really sp spanned out because... Uh, he started his own management agency after all. Yes. So he's not just uh, an actor. He's also, uh, he wants to produce. He has produced really successful films with his partner, Chong Woo Sung, and yes. it's been successful. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, he might have had, you know, that status in Korea, but as a kind of a business person mm -hmm. or an industry, uh, you know, icon, he's, you can see he's had a spectrum of uh, abilities that he's uh, showcased. As well as with the success, the global success of Squid Game, um, his popularity just kind of scaled um, in an unprecedented way. And so, like when when I think of him, um, you know, honestly, I, because I didn't have, I wasn't like a fan of his from the beginning. I kind of saw him and had to kind of look at it in reverse. And so, um, if you look at it in reverse, it's really it's it's really interesting that he, he's such a multifaceted uh, person in in that sense. You know, his management company uh, with his friend Chong Song, like they've actually grown that company to do so many things as well. And I believe they're not just actors, but they're actually directing and producing as well as involved in the entire filmmaking process. And one of my favorite scenes in um, Squid Game was when uh, his character um, in the very, I believe it's like the first episode, you know, when he introduced his character, he like feeds this cat um, on the street, like this, this stray cat, right. because he's like, you know, he's a bum too, but he's like still taking care of this street cat. And like, I was like, oh, that's such a, uh, to me, that's like a, a moment for the character that you can really empathize with. And that part I thought was uh, written by the director, right? Uh, the, the screenwriter, because, right. um, you know, you would assume that. But in the interviews that they had, the director was saying, actually, that was uh, Lee jung idea to be, uh, to feed the cat. And so to me, I, I saw that I was like, okay, this guy is not just an actor, but he also is, a, he has a creative mi uh, mindset, but he's also, um, you know, somebody who knows kind of what, what to uh, do to kind of present himself or connect himself with the audience mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a scene like that. So um, I, I believe uh, he has earned a lot. And, you know, unfortunately, the recent uh, news that uh, the Star Wars, uh, the mm -hmm. Acolyte um, was canceled and uh, will, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about that, but uh, I mean, there was a lot of talk even it was contra controversial to have him be uh that character um a leading character in that series and there was always you know the kind of the race issue some people were saying like other you know i don't know if you heard about the rumors of other people who were being considered for that role uh, but like there's there's this whole you know internet like conspiracy about like oh he wasn't the first choice as the director said in an interview or some people are like he was the first choice because she you know uh, the director thought of him in the very beginning, stuff like that. But I mean, uh, his, his popularity, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, pop his popularity um, has, you know, really reached that point where now, you know, he is uh, a character <laughs> in Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> uh, although it wasn't um, as successful as the original shows, but like still, you know, it shows kind of where he's, where, you know, kind of how far he's come and right. uh, as well as his global notor his global uh, popularity. And um, I think even though it is kind of sad news that it was canceled, uh, there's still, you know, it's still a, a significant moment, uh, milestone in his career. And I think it's going to only get better from here. All right. Uh, let's I, I pivot to maybe Squid Game Season 2 coming up in December 26. Maybe that will live yes. up or exceed people's expectations. We'll wait and see. I mean, that might be the new, the next test for the actor himself, yep. uh, Lee jong -jae. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, you know, previously before that announcement of Season 2, uh, yeah, I think you and I, we both kind of mentioned that, oh, we're going to have to wait to see Season 2 to see if it's gonna um you know gonna get that accolade but they when they announced season three with season two i was like man it's over like it doesn't <laughs> matter now like they can he can just you know the show can flop oh and it won't matter now because um th that's how much this is uh, t 
that's a sign of how important this um, show is to uh, the network. Netflix, right? Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, um, it, it won't matter. I, I, I bet they're just shooting. They're writing, directing, shooting. Um, they're in production of season two and three at the same time, which is probably why they're mm. you know able to do uh, Ready that to announce. Okay. Yeah, okay. but yeah, it's just like okay, now we can't even we can't even judge it, right? Like when it comes in December, <laughs> we can't even look at it with objective eyes because now we know, hey, season three is coming. So mm -hmm. um, either you're going to be a hyped or you're not. It's just before the show even drops. Well, either way, it's good for the actor, isn't it? Like you said, um, even if it flops, he'll get another chance with season three. And it's actually a good sign that Netflix is willing to invest so much into a series that has clearly the global's attention. I mean, and like you alluded to earlier, who walked out of the pandemic as a bigger star? There's not a very long list. Yeah. And also, you know, and not just the actors, you know, I mean, today we're talking about like the impact of Hallyu, right? Um, uh, I mean, Hallyu actors as well, but I mean, the entire impact of Korean content, um, mm -hmm. I think to, to the larger picture, uh, Squid Game has, it is kind of the, you know, the, the calling card or the, um, the example of how, how popular Korean content has become in mm -hmm. the last you know, few decades. All right. I knew today's talk was ambitious. Let's move on to uh, the second question today. Our second focus is on actress Yoon Yo Jung. How can he leave her out and her crowning moments at the Academy Awards as both recipient and a really memorable award presenter? Uh, her career has spanned decades, much longer than even our aforementioned uh, actor Lee Jung Jae. But before the success of Minaria Pachinko, I mean, she had countless productions in TV and films. She survived a highly publicized divorce and is loved for her outspoken character. What do you think is yeah. the Yoon Yeo Jung appeal in 2024? You know, um, unfortunately, you know, uh, female actors, actors, um, they're, you know, a lot of times they're not judged on simply their like acting ability or skills. There's a lot of context. Yeah. Like, for example, that you mentioned the divorce and there's a lot of things that in their personal life that become kind of mixed in with their image. And there's a lot more baggage that they have to uh, deal with, I think. Um, there's a lot more scrutiny um, to, you know, female uh, act actors, um, depending on, you know, their the, the, the context. But what I really appreciated um, is that, you know, her being an actress or act be being an actor for so long, you know, she has done a lot of work. But when she was younger, uh, she wasn't recognized for a lot of that work. You know, it, it wasn't until way later when when. Her image for me, I don't even remember what she looked like, you know, uh, other than just this friendly grandma figure or this mother <laughs> figure, right? And I'm sure she she probably is like, you know, like, man, I did, you know, she would probably say like, I, I did so much work, but I'm only recognized with this. But I think that um, her appeal is that she has this motherly figure, a uh, motherly uh, uh, presence about her. And she's also got this down to earth um, kind of scruffy, you know, girl or, 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 or like tough grandma, you know, tough motherly <laughs> figure too. It's not like a, it's not like a pampering type of motherly figure. And in America, um, with the Academy Awards and, uh, and all the characters that she, she play, you know, um, I, I don't know if our audience has seen all of her movies, so I don't want to spoil it, but like, you know, she smokes in one of, in one of her characters, she's a, a, a grandmother who smokes, you know, mm. and like, it has this, like, it has this real, like, um, like uh, a realism that's like, Definitely not in a kind of a positive, uh, yeah. not always in a positive light. The Bacchus lady, right? Oh, oh, I mean, in that one, that was I, I, that's even more, right? That, right. That's, that, that, there that's was a even more different range, right? Right, right. Her range just, you know, it, is is broad. But the fact that uh, the Academy um, acknowledged her uh, was, regardless, uh, uh, irregardless of her age, um, and and in her, at this point in her career. I mean, I think that it was um, it, it shows that, hey, this is not a lady who uh, is definitely not being um, looked at on a physicality level. Mm. Um, she's looked at in, 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 a, in a whole um, her essence is being uh, judged. Mm. That's why she got the award. And so if you look at pictures of her when she was younger, I mean, yeah, she was beautiful. Like she was uh, and, and she, you know, people wouldn't she has a total different image because, you know, you roll back at, at the time and you roll back the clock. And like it's a total different presentation or image that she was uh, presenting mm. in her her roles but right now um all of the roles that she's getting you know, the the, accom the accomplishments you know the roles that she's being recognized for mm. i mean are all great um in that they are not just about physical looks but it's about um how she brings this character to life mm. in a way that the audiences uh really enjoy uh listening to experiencing and in a way kind of want to see more of 
Right. Uh, for her cheeky sense of humor, resilience, and it's clearly a reflection of a life fully lived. As she said before in several interviews before, at a certain time, she was taking on every single job. She was never saying no because she had to literally make ends meet. For an actor to be able to say that on, on the record, uh, not caring so much about the image or the tough life that she's led, it was refreshing. Oh, yeah, definitely. And so, mm. I mean, that kind of appeal is... Um, Something that uh, global audiences a lot of times appreciate as well. So, like her being a, a, a you know accomplishing this feat of um, being crowned those uh, Academy Awards, I think it's uh, it, it, it it was good uh, to see as a outsider, you know, or like a third party. Okay. And um, and it makes me you know look forward to what her next um, you know how she will continue to be relevant in this industry because she she is going to have a great legacy. Pachinko too is where you can find her. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. All right. I know we're jumping around uh, the timeline a little bit further back, but because we're limited on time, I'm going to skip along to the old boy days, perhaps at a time when Korean Ooh. films felt more niche globally. He was already can famous for Park chan now called classic old boy. Uh, um, long before so many Korean actors and directors are seen in the red carpets of Cannes, there was old boy. And so what was its appeal two decades ago? And what is its standing appeal as a cult classic today? So when I think of old boy, um, uh, this is obviously going to be just my opinion. So it, it's not, it could be, I could totally be wrong, but I got vibes of like the sick. I have, a, I have feelings of like the sixth sense. I don't know if you remember that. Film. Oh yeah. Um, so <clears throat> the sixth sense movie, uh, you know, and I don't want to spoil it for our audience who, you know, since it, it you know, it, it was a huge spoil spoiler, but there, uh, that movie had this, you know, at the end of the movie, it's like, you know, it's like an eye lifting, like WTF moment um, where like, what's going on? Like, wait, what did I just watch? But also old boy had this kind of that kind of severe, like, um, you know, like reversal or twist plot twist that made me go like, oh, wait, what? And so I actually, you know, because of that, and I had to watch it. I, I wanted to watch it again. You know, it was kind of like those also, you know, films like um, uh, Memento, uh, which was another uh, film that, you know, at the end of the film, there was like a, a reversal or a. Uh, um, a plot twist that made you kind of re-examine all the things, or you you wanted to kind of re-experience uh, or re-see. So, I, I in that sense, the the thriller, um, the, the kind of genre of that film, which is probably why you know, like uh, it was such a um, a hit at Con, uh, and it was actually remade, you know, and uh, it, it was remade um, in many countries. Uh, it, uh, not, oh, I mean, not many countries, but like it was definitely I, the the U.S. version as well as I believe there was an. Um, like an unofficial uh, like a Indian or Hindi remake of it, of it as well. Mm. But like, I mean, it was very popular. It was in the zeitgeist. And um, so many people around the world, when they uh, kind of saw it and, and, and like you know, experienced it, they were just like, man, this movie. And, and, and I'm only talking about, you know, just kind of the, the writing, the plot, um, the story, right? As well as if, if there was other fans who just loved the production of it, the, the cinematography, um, the way that it was out edited and the way that it was portraying kind of um, uh, the, the action and the violence in, in a kind of visceral way that was so uh, refreshing in a way uh, compared to like all the CGI. And I mean, back in the day, you know, like this is like uh, when CGI was really taking off. And so you would see, you, you know, you, you would see like stills of, of films that were all shot on green screen or blue screen or you know what I mean and like hmm. they were all like kind of it, it, it coming from there it, there was a realism to this film and I think that that's uh what the actor brought as well as the director um and so there was a lot of this film that uh kind of really hit that perfect moment um hmm. and it really became one of uh you know director Park chan calling cards uh, mm -hmm. in the industry hmm. and it you know it kind of set him up as uh one of Korea's uh, most um, mm. acknowledged and uh, respected filmmakers. <laughs> I can't believe we ran out of time, but I'm just going to summarize one of the last points I wanted to make because we've come a long way since the heydays of TV drama when TV dramas were hitting 40 to 50 percentile ratings, which is virtually unheard of. I think most productions would be happy with 10 percent. Oh, yeah. Just being the double digits is a score these days because they're competing against streaming like Netflix's Squid Game, for example. And in the heyday of TV drama, we had the likes of Winter Sonata, Stairway to Heaven, Full House, anyone? Oh. 
<laughs> and then there was the appeal of Taejang and the Jewel in the palace. Uh, at its highest ratings in 2004, it hit 57.8%. At the center was actress Yeonghae. Any last words on that actor as we wrap up today's segment rather abruptly? <laughs> You know, that show was one, I mean, that show was like everywhere. This is like pre, uh, oh, pre-streaming, right? So In like videotapes at Korean yeah. markets, which is, by the way, illegal, but it was a culture of the times. And it was all over the world. I mean, uh, it wasn't just in like the, you know, diaspora of Korean uh, of immigrant populations, you know, and, and communities all in America or in, you know, it was in every corner of the world where people were watching this and it was non-Koreans that were watching it. And and just visually speaking, you know, there was so much that, um, you know, people were able to soak up mm -hmm. about Korean historical culture, which obviously it is fiction and it, it is fictionalized. Mm -hmm. uh, but because it was in a, you know, visual art form as a drama, it was like an everyday scene you could see and learn so much about Korea. It brought so many people to Korea as well. So For Korean I mean, food, maybe, and the palaces. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this, uh, the 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 doctor, um, the new version that they're working on. There is a new version that they're uh, making on, a spin -off. Uh, working on mm. the spinoff. So um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, looking forward to that. And I think that uh, that'll be whether it does uh, good or or not. Um, I think it will. It's. It, I'm just so glad that it will exist because that world is a a world that we need to go back to um, <laughs> and, and like re-experience sometimes. And I think it's a great um, kind of spin-off that they're doing. All right. Thank you so much, Isaac, for today's conversation. We'll speak to you again soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.